Hi, I'm Amy Karanik. I'm a Sculpey brand ambassador, and today I'm going to show you how to do some cane making. Now, cane making is a very popular way to create with polymer clay. Once you have made canes, you can use them in a variety of ways, from home decor to jewelry making. So today I'm going to show you how to make flower canes and how to make these earrings using the canes. In case you're wondering what I mean by a cane is, a cane has a two-dimensional image when you look at it from the cross-section. And that two-dimensional image goes all the way through the three-dimensional cane. And so what you have is this glorious little rod of design that you can cut real thinly. And every time you cut it, for the most part, you're going to have a thin cross-section of that same design. And so from that, you can make jewelry items, or you could cover a picture frame, you could do home decor, you can do all kinds of things with these once they are constructed. So today, I'm actually going to show you two canes, two simple canes, one being what we call a bullseye, which is how I made the middle, another one being called a jelly roll, which is how I made the petals. And then when we take those two simple canes and combine them together, we have a more complex cane which yields a flower. So in this case, a flower cane would be the complex cane. The jelly roll and the bullseye would be the simple canes. All right, so let's get started. Let's clean my area so I have room to work. And I'll bring in my clay that we're using today. And I am using um, Primo, uh, Primo Sculpey. You can use any of the clays in the clay line. You could use Souffle, you could even use Sculpey 3. Um, you can use whatever clay you like working with. Um, but I usually stick to Primo and Souffle because um, I end up making a lot of jewelry items and I like the strength and the flexibility of Primo and Souffle for creating jewelry because jewelry takes probably a lot more wear and tear than one might think. And so I like jewelry pieces to be very strong. And so that's why we're focusing on Primo. So I've got a little sheet. This is a quarter of a bar of, of Primo in white. And I just have it sheeted through um, my pasta machine or you could use an acrylic roller on the thickest setting. And what I'm making first is the bullseye cane. So the middle of the bullseye cane um, is going to be yellow and it's gonna be wrapped in white. And so a great way to hand condition a lump of clay like I'm doing right now is to push some of your body heat through that like I'm doing and then roll it a bit and more heat. Really get the energy moving through that so that it gets warm and soft and pliable. And all we need to do with this yellow, which is the absolute center of the bullseye, is make a little um, rod that would be even in size all the way along its length. So something to check for when you're making canes. Sometimes um, you'll notice that oven-baked clays might have a more natural soft consistency and some others will be a little stiffer. And when you're making a cane, you kind of want all of your clays to be the same consistency. Um, you don't want one to be super soft and one to be super firm because um, when you go to reduce the cane, when, and what I mean by reducing is we're gonna take the cane from this larger diameter down to the smaller diameter by reducing it. If you have clays inside the cane that are of varying consistencies, um, the soft clays are always going to move faster and the hard clays will move slower. And so um, you want to have as much usable cane as you possibly can and so you want all the clays to move at the same rate. For example, when I turn this the other way, these are the, the ends of canes are always going to be a little distorted and probably not usable um, for this actual application. So the closer in consistency you can get um, all your clay textures, then the, the less of that scrap you will have. All right, so I'm just forming a little 
rod of this is sunshine yellow and I already have a sheet of white sheeted through on the thickest setting the reason I'm pushing on the ends is just to try to make sure that the whole thing is really compacted and um, it's all the same you know um, diameter throughout so let's make our little um, let's make our little rod about the same width as our white sheet we'll just cut a scrap end of this off we'll roll that up touch it to the yellow so they'll stick together then keep rolling using firm pressure where the white uh, lead edge touches the back just um, let those push together and then unroll it and you have this little mark that indicates where you should trim the sheet okay then you'll just roll this back in now when you're making a bullseye cane you always want your lead edge and your back edge to butt together you do not want an overlap and this is the most simple bullseye cane you can make because it's only two colors um, if you wanted to you could continue wrapping more and more and more colors each one around making it bigger and bigger and bigger and as long as it always butts up um, seam at the seam and does not overlap then that is a bullseye cane um, and it's one of the most basic canes you can make and it's the basis for many other more complicated canes so we're just going to put that aside for now I'll turn these back over so you can have a better look at these okay next we're going to make that jelly roll cane and so for that I have two um, equally thick sheets of Primo this one's purple and this one is lavender and so the first thing I want to do is cut a straight edge on both of those and they I processed them through my pasta machine so that they would come out about the same width and that's what I want and so I am just going to layer one over the other like so if you want to you can trim that now or you can trim it later and then I'm going to roll these together with my acrylic clay roller okay uh oh I got something on the work surface that just got I think that was liquid sculpting I'm just gonna let it be it'll cause more problems for me to try to get it off there I think <clears throat> All right, so now I'm actually thinning the sheet by continuing to roll it more. And the reason I'm thinning it is because um, I, I want to increase the amount, um, the length of the piece, and I want the layers to be skinnier. So I'm just going to continue to roll it like so. Roll it this way for good measure. Okay, let's go ahead and trim these wonky edges off just so you can see what I'm doing more clearly and just set the scraps aside save all your scraps you can do something with those you can make marbled clay or something but that's a great thing about oven baked polymer is that you really don't ever have anything you can't reuse no matter how random it looks okay so now um, what we want to do with this jelly roll is determine which color we want to end up on the outside of the roll so for example I'm going to fold it in half. Do I want to trap the light color on the inside or do I want to trap the dark color on the inside? And I am going to go with the light color on the inside because leaving the dark color on the outside will create more um, contrast against my, the center of my flower, which is this one. Okay? So I'm going to fold this in half. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a nice crease here without an air bubble in it. So I'm pushing it side to side to move the air out the sides. Okay, so now I have a nice double sheet and I'm going to reduce this again and thin it. Now cane making, um, I feel, is a little bit more of a precise process than, say, mokumegane or making terrazzo or making marbled clay um, especially if you want your canes to have a very uniform look when you're completely done with them 
the more precise you are as you build the cane, the more precise the cane will come out in the end. So at this point, the reason I'm telling you that is if you want, um, you could trim this off or you could incorporate that wonky edge into the cane. Either way is fine. It just depends on how you like to work. Okay, so I'm going to now um, start rolling this up. And at first I go really slowly so that I don't trap any air in that tiny roll I'm making. And then once I feel that um, I'm, I've, there, I have, have less chance of trapping air in there, I'm just going to go really, I can go a little quicker. Now if you see an air bubble, you can pop them. The thing about air bubbles in canes is um, if you leave an air pocket inside the cane, when you go to reduce it, which we're going to do after a while, um, you can actually, if there's an empty pocket in there, the clay on its own will decide if it's going to fill that pocket or not and you won't have control over which color goes into that empty pocket. So that's why you'll hear me talk a lot about not trapping air inside a cane. That way we stay in more control. Okay, so I just kept rolling that until that seam just pretty much disappeared and blended into the side of the cane. Okay. All right. Okay, now let's go back and as I'm making a flower cane, I kind of work back and forth, back and forth. I'll work um, next, I'll be working on the, uh, the center. So the, the middle of this cane, you can't really see it all that well, but it's actually a whole bunch of tiny, tiny bullseyes stacked up to bundled up together in there. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our bullseye cane and turn it into what we usually call a lace cane. So what I'm doing right now is reducing. I'm applying even pressure from one end of the cane to the other and everyone has to come up with their own method of doing this well. It takes a lot of practice and some people will work from the middle out, some people work from one end to the other. You can see I pick up the cane and I flip it into end several times. Um, it just takes some practice to get your own method going. And so uh, there's not much, you know, getting around that, around the whole practice factor. But they're very rewarding when you make a beautiful cane and you cut it open for the first time. And so it's worth it to practice good technique and, and you know, do a good job. So. You can see that this has gotten quite a bit longer and thinner. And to make the inside of that lace cane, um, I want at least seven pieces. And I'll show you why in a minute. So I'm going to pull out a ruler here. And this is about nine inches long. So. So that would give me about, if I did each one as an inch, you're going to have to do a lot of math with caning. If I did each one as an inch, that'd be seven inches. If I did each one as an inch and a quarter, that would be closer to the full length. Now, also another thing you have to decide is you can already see that the ends are going to be distorted. And so do you want to cut those off and start fresh, which is what I like to do. Um, it's save that scrap clay for, for uh you know, another project. I've got at least nine good inches of usable cane. So I'll remove those extra ends. Just getting my ruler out of the way so I don't cut it. So as you can see when I cut that off, that's a really nice bullseye right there. And then I'll do the same thing on this end because where you see that yellow, I'm just gonna stretch this real quick. Where you see that yellow, um, that's going to indicate that it's not perfect. I'm using a rolling cut because I want the cane to stay round and it's very warm in this place where I'm working and my clay is quite warm. So I use that rolling cut to keep my cuts more consistent. Okay, I'm at nine inches, so I'm going to cut 
um, each section down to one and a quarter. So that'd be here, one and a quarter, two and a half, three and three quarters, five, six and a quarter, seven and a half, eight and three quarters. So that's almost, almost perfect. Um, I try to work with a cane piece that's always at least an inch long. Uh, I don't like to go much lower than that. So that's why I was being pretty particular about it being, I knew I needed seven pieces and I wanted them to be at least an inch long. And these are an inch and a quarter, so. Okay, now I'm gonna stand these up with one in the middle and six around the edge. That's why I needed seven of these. And that is your basic flower um, principle. And so that works really well. Okay, so now this will be the new middle of our flower cane. And the reason we did that is because it just gives a lot more um, interest and detail and it's so easy to go from bullseye to lace achieving like just a lot of more detail inside. Okay, so let me point out that this is technically now it's a lace cane, but it's also a flower cane because it has the basic flower shape. But I'm not going to fill in these empty gaps. And so because I'm not filling those in, as I reduce this, it's going to fill those in itself with that excess white clay around the outside and become a white circle. And that's perfectly fine. And I'm not going to reduce real far because there's a balance between the inside of the flower and the petals of the flower. And I, if I can help it, I don't want to end up with a whole bunch of, of one and not enough of the other because I've made the whole thing too big. So I can always reduce this more, but for now I'm just going to go that far. All right, let's go back to our petals for a bit. And what I want to do is I want to reduce this a bit. using my same technique that I did before where I just flip end to end. Um, now this is a, a what you could call a register mark right here and if you keep that straight you'll know that the whole everything on the inside of the cane is rolling straight as well. So this cane, this flower has eight petals and so what I'm going to do is show you how to turn this jelly roll into sort of more of a um, an oval shaped petal. And so I'm flattening one side of the cane and then I'll flip it over on the flat side and flatten this side. And so I'm just going to squish it back up a little bit. What we're going to do so we're going to cross section this cane to make eight uh, petals that won't look like such a jelly roll. So what I want to do now is get this down to about, so that's about six usable inches. That would give me an inch and a half long piece. There I go with the math again, but it really can't be avoided. <laughs> So inch and a half is going to be good. And I'm going to go ahead and trim the ends off. So there's that, that jelly roll. Okay. And then I'm going to cut these all in, into four sections, which would be an inch and a half each. Inch and a half, three, four and a half. Okay, then I'm going to cut each one of these in half this way so that what I have is two petals like so. And you want to kind of get your head over the top and see that you're going right down the middle. I don't want to get my head in the way of the camera, so, or the lighting. 
Okay, so now I have eight of these. Okay, the next thing I can do is check how this is going to work out with this. And I'm not attaching these, I'm just playing it out to see how that's going to look. If it's if it can go all the way around, this is just a pre-plan right here. If my middle is too big, then my last two petals won't touch. And they do, but there is a gap there. I feel like I could snug those up quite a bit more. So what I'm going to do is reduce the middle a little bit more. So just gently remove these and roll the middle down again. Just a little more. And there's another trick you can do, say if you want to try to get your petals in a little closer, is you can pinch this these edges up toward each other. Okay. So, okay, so I'm going to check again. This time I'm going to pinch these up and I'm going to position them opposite each other because I have an even number of petals. That means I have, you know, like a north, south, east, west, and then everything in between. That makes it really easy to um, put these together. Keep going. And put these in between. And you want to make sure that it sits right down in there on top of that center, the center of the flower. You don't want it, you want it to seat right in there, not float. No floating. It has to sit, it has to come into contact with that white. Okay. Two more. Put this one in here. Now if you've got one that's stubborn and won't go all the way in, you might rock the petal next to it out, allowing that one to sit down in there better. Just take your time. Think good thoughts. Get into the flow here and it'll all work out. Okay. Now that's looking pretty good. I like that. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and trim this excess middle out. I could have done that before. I'm doing it now. And we're going to save that. I'm going to show you that's going to come in really handy. Okay, so remember when I built that flower cane out of the middle colors and I said how I'm going to let the white move around into the gaps? and make a white border around the middle. Well, this time I want to preserve the shape of my petals. And so what I have to do to preserve this shape and keep the petals looping out, looping out, looping out, is I have to pack that with another color. And that's how this happens here. Each petal has it's preserved and it's looping out, looping out, because I packed it with this color in here that wouldn't allow those purples to all just swim together because we want to reduce this quite a bit further. So I'm going to use my excess middle to pack those, um, those shapes in there to keep my petals, to keep their, their petal shape so that it doesn't get lost. So first I'll just start by reducing this. And this cane right now is about an inch and a half tall and I'm going to need eight of those um, placeholders that are eight, eight and a half or an inch and a half. So that is almost what, 12 inches? We can do it. All right, so I have this reduced round now. But the actual shape that would fit best into here, if I take my blade and I hold it across two petals, 
Obviously the best shape that would fit in there is a triangle. So what I can do from this point is I can start changing this to a triangle. And the way I do that is just to pinch the top really hard with my fingers. And as I'm pinching this into a triangle, I'm changing it from a circle to a triangle, it's also reducing. It's going to get longer and longer and longer. I'll turn it one third turn and now I pinch the new top. So basically in cane making, your simplest cane forms are either going to be round like this, triangular like I'm doing right now, or square. And so those are the three shapes that are easiest to reduce. Um, the round one, you've already seen me reduce that by rolling it by hand. The triangular one I'm reducing right now by repetitively pinching the top edge. And then the square one, if you can picture that, um, a square cane, you can obviously reduce it by rolling each flat side, turning the cane, and then rolling it again. And I'm sure we have some examples of square caning on our website, Sculpey.com. There's literally thousands of projects on there that can inspire and teach you and give you all kinds of step-by-step -step tutorials of how to do all of this in a more, like in a smaller format, like if you want to learn a square cane, which I'm not covering today, I'm sure you can find it on there. All right, so I said I need eight of these, each one to be about an inch and a half if I want to use that whole cane, and so I need to take this to 12. I'm at 10 right now, so all I have to do is just stretch it a bit. Once the clay is really soft, it, it stretches so easily, and so I think we're probably about there. Um, I'm going to trim the end, and then I'll show you a trick that I like to do. I don't even cut this into sections. I just take that point and I put it right in there between those petals. And it's actually stretching even more as I do this. And I'm using fingertip pressure to push it in place. Just keep adding these all the way around and you're using quite a bit of fingertip pressure because you want that little point to go down in there between the petals. Here's another thing that's unique to caning is <laughs> Like, I'm telling you to use a lot of fingertip pressure and really push that point down in there. But on the other side, as you're holding this in place, <laughs> you don't want to smush the whole thing either. So there's like this weird balance of pressuring this piece in, but not letting these holding, you know, fingers smash. So you'll figure it out. <laughs> it's just a lot about you know, uh, making that gentle touch, you know, work for you without smushing the other thing. All right, we got three to go. I think we're going to make it. Remember, this was more of that leftover center, but because we reduced it so much to get it out to 12 inches, it's, it's not going to look like you just repeated the center. It's going to be the detail that has been reduced in there is so fine now. Okay, one more. Just pushing it in. Okay, now we'll just trim this off. Okay. Now I'm going to take just a moment and actually just apply opposite pressure from this triangle to that one, um, seating those triangles way in there as best as I can. So I'm applying more pressure to the white part than anything. And you gotta fill those gaps with the color you want there or as you reduce the cane it will fill them for you. Okay, so now I'm gonna reduce this to a size that's more useful for my earring making. And what I'm doing right now is sort of a ritual <laughs> of, of just feeling the cane and feeling that all the elements are connecting to each other and 
feeling that I don't have trapped air bubbles and that it's going to all reduce well. Now I do have a little disclaimer. Um, I don't make canes every day. I have made canes for years and years. Uh, I don't make them every day, but the thing you need to know is that when you re when when you reduce this, it's not going to look exactly like that one because I might have my purple sheet thicker in this one than I had in that one. Or, um, you know, there's all kinds. Of, I realized after I did this that the middle of this one had a lot more of the lace to it than my seven pointed lace has here. So. They're all beautiful, they're all nice, but they're not all exact. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. All right, just for fun, let's cut the end off of this so you can see where we began and where we're going to end up, okay? I'm using a rolling cut just because it's so warm in here and the clay is really warm. I don't want to smash the cane. And so. My blade must have not been clean, but you get the idea. There is how big we started, okay? And now we're going to start reducing. So when I start reducing a larger, thicker cane like this, um, I'm actually focusing on areas that are not moving as quick, and I'm putting more pressure there. and less pressure in other places. I'm generally putting a lot of pressure in the middle because that's where the most useful parts of the cane are going to be, are in the middle. So I want to make sure any, if there wasn't an air bubble trapped in there, it would have a chance to work out toward the end. Okay, and this is just basic reduction. We're reducing the cane. Then I'm going to give a little roll. Sometimes when I make larger canes, I will like to save some of the cane in its large shape and then, and then keep reducing some of the cane so that I have like a medium and a small and a tiny. And that's a really good practice too. Um, it's very easy to, re to reduce canes, but it is some, it's really difficult to increase them. Some people can do it. So here's our medium cut. Let me see if I can clean this one up just so it looks better. So we can have a good comparison. That looks a little better. So there's our large, there's our medium. And see how much purpler this one is? That's because my dark purple sheet was thicker than the purple sheet that I put in there. And you can do that, you know, intentionally or unintentionally. <laughs> the more the more canes you make, the better you'll be at doing it intentionally. Okay, so remember how I talked about register marks earlier. Anytime you make a striped cane like this, you have those those beautiful built-in register marks. That helps you keep reducing the cane straight. And with a flower, it wouldn't be such a big deal if the interior twisted. But if you really get into this and you start making face canes or something with a lot of detail, you don't want that to twist. You want to be in control. And so those register marks really help you keep it all straight. Let's cut, it, let's cut again and see what we have. These are really looking cute. So we've got the large, the medium, the small. And you could basically just keep reducing this until you can't even see the flower in there. Okay? So let's real quickly make something with this so that you can see how fun it is to use um, the canes once you have them made. Okay? So I think I'll take this light purple and just real quickly make you know what, I'm, I'm going to use this scrap because this is really fun to show you how to use up your scrap. And I'm just going to blend this into like a partial blended color. 
and it will go well with our cane because it is, uh, you know, the sum total of all the colors that we're using there is, is in here. So that will look really nice. I'm just going to condition it a little bit. And these are just scraps that I picked up. We, we could have thrown those in, but I kind of liked seeing those the way they are. So I just want to keep stretching this so I have enough real estate to apply my cane slices to, to make two earrings. That'll probably be well about right, right there. Okay, just lay that flat and then what we can do is slide, make some slices. I'm going to get a smaller blade and I'm going to wipe it off really well. Blade sharpness and cleanliness is really key with with cane slicing. Some people will stick their clean, their canes, their warm canes in the refrigerator for a few minutes to let them sit. Some people will make their canes on one day and let them sit, you know, overnight so that they're not so warm when they're trying to slice them. Everyone has their method. And I'm just slicing off really thin. These are probably about a sixteenth of an inch thick. And I just want to make sure I have enough. So these look really cute. I'm just flattening them and making sure they're really round. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to cre create a veneer with my cane slices over this purple background. So any place that my blade or the rolling or the warmth of the room has kind of flattened the cane, I am taking my time to pull it back out round. And then I'm going to nestle this next row right up close to the one before, filling in that negative space. and just keep applying the little slices in a veneer in a consistent pattern over the top like that. Okay, so now we've made like a little a little cute wallpaper of these flowers. And I want to double check that I have enough here to make like two that would be way too big. So let's make them a little smaller. I want to make some earrings. And what I'm going to do is just fill in that end spot down at the bottom in case I need it. This is a good trick, is to cut your cane slices in half and fill in like that, where you don't need whole ones. Okay, next what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to roll this with my acrylic roller. So I'm releasing it from the work area. I'm going to roll it. I'm going to pull it up and roll it another direction. And I'm just seating all those little cane slices right into the purple background. That looks so cute. Okay, so now they're all smooth and level and I'm ready to cut out. Now that I've done that, I wonder if I could make, a little, make them a little bigger. I bet I could. Yeah. So I'm just going to cut out two circles. Yeah. With my cutters. And then I can cut a little center hole like I did for these. And that would be the hole where the jump ring is placed. So cute. Then these would get baked 275 for 30 minutes and you would be ready to turn them into earrings. All right. Now while I have you here, I want to show you one more super fun thing to do to make a bead. 
you can take this scrap clay and you can see I've even used different parts and different shapes to make caned earrings. In this model here, the center is just part of that, the center cane of the flower. If you roll this into a ball, then you can cut several of these little flowers and put them all around and that's how you can make dimensional beads. I'll just show you that real quick and then I'll let you, I can show you how to assemble the jump rings. So all you have to do is have a ball of, and this can even be your scrap clay, and put a series of these cane slices all around evenly. And let's put one on top and one on the bottom. Okay, put that in that blank space and that one there. And then just make sure they're attached really well and then just roll it up. Just using enough hand pressure to help those little canes like kind of spread into each other and then you have this beautiful little flower bead and you can just poke through it with one of your favorite skewering tools like so. Go through one way, when it comes out the other way then go back through. Isn't, isn't that cute? That's your bonus bead. Okay, let me just show you how it works to turn your items into actual functioning earrings. This is the pair I was talking about earlier and I'll just show you how to open and close jump rings so that you can make your own jewelry items. So I already have a jump ring on here. Jump rings come in so many types of metal. They come in, you know, silver tone, silver plated, sterling silver, gold, antique gold, copper, whatever you want to get to match your clay look or your design. And so all you have to do is open and close the jump ring using two sets of pliers. And when you open and close jump rings, you always twist one toward you and one away. That means you're opening the jump rings like this, not like this. So you don't want to stretch jump rings. You just want to twist them open. And so in this design, which I love this type of design with the bigger hole in the middle, you just um, thread the jump ring through. And then on the ear wire, I have an additional jump ring so that I'm turning the ear wire so that the pair of earrings is oriented um, flush to your face, not like parallel to the side of your head. I generally try to make earrings so that when you're looking at someone um, full in the face you can see the design of the earring with the with the ear wire going through um, that way. So that's a real easy way to do jump rings. If you want to add holes like in this sample of this pair, um, all you need to do is just uh, here's a good example. This pair is basically just cane slices. So if we took a slice off of this sort of medium sized cane and then we make sure and reform it real nice so it's nice and even. I'm going to lay that down. I'm actually going to kind of bevel the edge with my fingertips. Stretch it back out to round and then bevel it down with my fingertips. So if you want to apply a hole up here at the top so that you can just you know connect to jump rings like so um, or an ear wire like these. Um, all you have to do is just go right in here and decide where you want the hole to be. Use your blunt point tool and this time I'm going to put it right in the pedal. And then what you'll want to do is pick that up gently and then go back through the other side just to make sure that little excess rim of clay um, is tucked back in to the back. We hope you've enjoyed learning how to make these flower canes and the earrings with them. If you would like to check out more inspiration and thousands of projects, please visit our website, Sculpey.com. And if you post your creations to social media, please use the hashtags Sculpey and How Do You Sculpey so that we can check out your designs.